Take a look at this photo. At first, you may not notice much, but a little more attention reveals the wings and tail. This is the plane lying five kilometers under the Pacific Ocean, and it could be an important clue that could shed light on one of the most mysterious, bizarre, and unsolved events in aviation history for almost 90 years. So what happened to Amelia Earhart? Let's take a look at this legendary story together. Let's go back to 1937, when modern aviation was still in its infancy. During the First World War, the strategic importance of airplanes was understood, and countries were doing their best to take aviation technologies one step further. At the same time, the footsteps of the Second World War were becoming increasingly evident. In particular, Nazi Germany's air weapons and the air attacks of the Japanese Navy were going down in history as moves that would change the course of the war. So if you asked who was the most famous pilot in the world in 1937, eyes would automatically turn to the then 40-year-old master pilot, Amelia Mary Earhart. In 1932, Earhart became the first woman aviator to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. Just 25 years before this achievement, brothers Wilbur and Orville Wright, who went down in history as the first men to successfully fly a flying machine, had claimed that a flying machine could never fly from New York to Paris. In short, that an airplane could never cross the Atlantic Ocean. Although what they really meant there was not airplanes, but blimps. But still, at that time it was believed that an engine could not run non-stop for the time it would take to cross the Atlantic Ocean. That is, for about four days. The Wright brothers were also wrong about airships. In 1928, the Graf Zeppelin successfully completed the first flight of the transatlantic, proving the inventors of the airplane wrong. Amelia Earhart's extraordinary achievements in piloting, which was seen as a man's job, by a woman who had only won the right to vote and be elected 15 years earlier in the United States, brought her international fame. She flew not only across the Atlantic Ocean, but also across the continental United States by herself, becoming the first person to fly solo from Hawaii to the United States, pushing the limits. One day, however, Earhart would suddenly disappear from the sky, leaving no trace. Fearless pilot Amelia Earhart's goals were now higher. She wanted to be the first woman pilot to fly a full circle around the world. Of course, there had been pilots before her who had circumnavigated the globe, but they had all chosen to shorten the distance by flying from northern latitudes. Earhart, who was working as a technical advisor at Purdue University's aviation department at the time, and was particularly supportive of female students, hoped to take a route closer to the equator, making a total of 47,000 kilometers and becoming the first person to truly circumnavigate the globe. When you break down this arduous journey, you realize that there were not many experiential obstacles for Earhart. She had already made it across America, for example, so it was not impossible for her to repeat the route. She had already crossed the Atlantic Ocean, a difficult goal, but nothing Earhart couldn't do. But when you look at the map, it becomes clear that the biggest challenge of the route is crossing the Pacific Ocean. She only needed to fly 2,900 kilometers to cross the Atlantic Ocean, but 10,500 kilometers to cross the Pacific Ocean in one go. The difference was mind-boggling. For this reason, the Pacific Ocean was divided into a two-stage route. The first stop was the small island of Howland, 4,113 kilometers away. From there, it was on to Honolulu, 3,000 kilometers away, and the final stage was to fly another 3,900 kilometers to California. Thus, the round-the-world trip would be completed. Fearless pilot Amelia Earhart chose the Electra 10E twin-engine airplane, tail number NR16020, specially produced by Lockheed for this challenging mission. Nicknamed the Flying Laboratory, the plane's fuel tanks and communication systems were specially modified for Earhart's mission. But don't let the name mislead you. Earhart did not aim to conduct any meaningful scientific research during the flight, but rather to gather material for her next book and as much public attention as possible as she continued her life as a writer. In March 1937, a west to east route was plotted and the first attempts were made. In the first phase of this attempt, Earhart was accompanied by navigator Fred Noonan, an expert in navigation and aviation, experienced in sidereal navigation, Harry Manning, who had captained the President Roosevelt and was also a pilot, and whose knowledge of Morse code was vital. And finally, Paul Mance, an aerobatic pilot in Hollywood who had been specially selected to improve Earhart's flying abilities. 
Unfortunately, on the first leg from California to Hawaii, they had to make a forced landing at Pearl Harbor due to problems with the lubrication of the plane's undercarriage. Once repaired, the plane would continue on its way to Howland Island, a small island in the Pacific. An island that would change Earhart's life just a few months later. However, due to a fault in the airplane, the cause of which is still unclear, they were unable to make a successful takeoff from Hawaii. Fortunately, no one was hurt in this minor accident, but the plane had to be taken to California and repaired in detail. This was the first sign of the strange disaster that was to befall them. After the plane was repaired in May 1937, the necessary funds were gathered for the second attempt and the route was redetermined. Due to the reversal of air currents with the change of seasons, it was decided that this time it would make more sense to fly from west to east. Therefore, the Pacific flight would no longer take place at the beginning of the route, but at the end. In addition, Captain Manning, who had complained about the delays caused by the failure of the first attempt, decided to leave the team. Aerobatic pilot Mance, on the other hand, did not want to take part in the flight in the new attempt, claiming that the cause of the first accident was piloting error. This left only Captain Pilot Amelia Earhart and experienced navigator Fred Noonan. Fearful of failing again, and this time of being publicly humiliated, the pair quietly took off from Oakland, California, without informing journalists, and began the first leg of the journey to Miami. Fortunately, there were no unfortunate incidents, and the two arrived safely in Miami. Here, Earhart's grand tour of the world was grandly announced to journalists, and the great flight officially began. The duo began their journey by landing in South America before Miami. From Fortaleza, they sailed into the Atlantic Ocean and reached a car in Western Africa. After crossing the African continent, they headed first to Karachi and then to Bangkok. Finally, via Singapore, they arrived in Australia, in Papua New Guinea, on June 29, 1937, just 39 days after their departure. Now came the last great test, crossing the Pacific Ocean. The mission was such a huge and internationally recognized undertaking, and Earhart was so popular at the time that the U.S. Coast Guard sent a patrol boat, the Itasca, to Howland Island to meet her. This vessel would pick up their signals and assist with navigation if necessary. On July 2, 1937, in a strong headwind, Earhart and Noonan began their eastward flight from Leh Airport in Papua New Guinea. While the first 1,000 kilometers of the journey went smoothly, Unexpected problems began to arise around 1,300 kilometers. Earhart was sending very clear and powerful voice signals to Itasca, but she could not hear the replies. The reasons for this are still debated today. According to some, Earhart did not know how to use the newly installed Bendix receiver on her plane well enough. According to others, a blown fuse in the plane's electronics meant that communication could only be established on one side. Others believed that the plane's receiving antenna had fallen off during takeoff from Papua New Guinea, but no such antenna was ever found. During this unexplained communication problem, Earhart could not find the ship even though she had been in the air for 1,300 kilometers. Moreover, they could not see the target island due to navigation errors. When we look at Itasca's radio records, we learn that around 7.30 in the morning, Earhart stated that they only had half an hour of fuel left and that they could not see the island they were going to land on. In another message received at 7.42, Earhart chillingly says, Itasca, we should be right over you, but we can't see you. We are almost out of gas. We can't reach you by radio. We are flying 300 meters above the water. At 300 meters altitude and still not being able to see the target island, despite the fact that Howland Island was a tiny place, the fact that the target was missed so much in such an important mission showed that there was definitely a serious failure in navigation. The experts on board the Itasca were doing their best to help them, but to no avail. For example, when radio communication was not clear, they sent Morse code on a different frequency. Earhart reported that she could hear these codes, but the problem was that she, like Noonan, did not know the Morse code. If you remember, it was Manning who knew Morse code by heart. He had already left the mission. Judging by the intensity of the signals received by Itasca, the plane must have been very close to the island. However, the ship could not see the plane in the air, nor could it clearly identify the target island. To improve visibility, Itasca used their boilers to produce black smoke, but over the dark waters of the ocean, it was not as visible as they thought. Within minutes, they were running out of fuel. Just minutes after their last message, 
Earhart's signals were lost forever. The plane had disappeared. The incident shocked the world. The U.S. Navy and Coast Guard joined forces and launched a massive search and rescue operation. For two weeks, $85 million in today's money was spent meticulously combing the surrounding islands in the ocean. It was the most costly search and rescue effort ever undertaken in American history. Teams from Japan and other countries even joined the search, but it was futile. The wreckage of the Electra was nowhere to be found. It was as if the plane had been buried deep in the ocean. On January 5, 1939, nearly two years after the incident, Earhart and Noonan were officially declared dead. Although 86 years have passed, the whereabouts of Earhart and her plane remain an unsolved mystery. In the process, Earhart built up a huge fan base of her own, and today countless private companies and organizations continue to make efforts to find the wreckage. The most likely scenario is that the plane crashed into the ocean and sank. But the Pacific Ocean is so deep, dark, and wide that it is extremely difficult to detect such a small and old wreckage. While some believe that Earhart reached a nearby island where she died of starvation and dehydration, many years later, bodies of possible plane wreckage survivors were found around Gardner Island, now known as Nikumaroro, one of the nearby Phoenix Islands. However, genetic testing which had not yet been developed at the time, was unable to identify the skulls and bones discovered. A 1968 analysis revealed that one of these skulls belonged to a European male. Subsequent tests have consistently yielded ambiguous results. For this reason, there are still those who believe that the bones belong to Earhart and Noonan. If this is true, they could have been trapped on the island after their plane crashed into the water and died shortly afterwards. A third possibility is that Earhart and Noonan may have been captured by the Japanese and killed in prison camps after the plane crashed near Saipan. However, compared to the possibility of a direct crash and sinking, these possibilities are considered highly unlikely, especially given the distance of the Japanese islands from the flight path and the strength of the last signals received by Itasca. To date, many people have tried to find the plane, but have come up empty-handed, deepening the mystery of the case. In 1999, during a deep dive off Howland Island, American professional sailor Donna Timmer detected a promising spot on the sonar screen towards the end of the dive. However, lacking the budget to dive to that depth, the mission was abandoned. In 2009, Ted Waite, founder of Gateway Computer, recovered some metal debris from the ocean floor, but none of the fragments found belonged to Earhart or the plane. The ocean research firm Nauticus dived in 2002 2006 and 2017, and recovered only a piece of pipe and debris from other ships. The total cost of all these massive searches ranges between 15 and $20 million in today's terms, revealing just how thick the veil of mystery Earhart left behind is. So Tony Romeo, a real estate investor and former U.S. Air Force intelligence officer turned pilot, and his team used $11 million from their real estate business to buy a drone called the Hugen from Norwegian underwater drone manufacturer Kongsberg. During their dive expeditions with this vehicle, each lasting 36 hours, they covered a huge area of 13,500 kilometers in total. And finally, at the end of the 30th day, they were able to take the famous sonar photo that they hoped would change everything. The photo shows what appears to be debris from an airplane five kilometers deep in the ocean, roughly resembling an Electra 10. Dorothy Cochran, curator of the aviation department at the Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum, says that the location of the plane does indeed match the available data. Sonar experts, on the other hand, while agreeing that these photographs are certainly worth examining, agree that they should not be considered as conclusive evidence until they are examined closely enough to read the aircraft's wing number. Indeed, future dives will answer the question of whether this trace, visible in the photograph, will be the last remaining trace of Earhart's legendary flight attempt.